Look at this thing. That is disturbing. It's weird. It's freaky. It's Main Pass 77A. It's an oil rig. And it's been here since 1983. It was built by Chevron. It pumped out 11 million barrels in its day, but its day is over. It's abandoned now. It's been abandoned since 2022. And it's not the only one out here. There are literally hundreds of these abandoned structures, from Louisiana to Alabama to Texas. They're on the continental shelf and stretching out to deeper and deeper waters. My interest in this subject started when I saw all those viral videos of people visiting and climbing all over abandoned oil rigs. But that view, though. I grew up on the Gulf, and it bothered me that these things were out there rotting. So I decided to do what we always do on Business Explains the World. Get out there and figure out how business got us into this situation and maybe how it can get us out. What I discovered was that the problem was much worse than I imagined. Now the oil's down there waiting for us. More oil trailers can start popping off. How did we end up with so many rigs out in the Gulf? Why do oil companies just leave them there? The whole ocean of oil under our feet. How dangerous is this? Fire at an offshore oil rig. And what can we do about it? Thank you sincerely to our sponsor, Framer. If you rewind back to the late 1940s when they started building these structures out here, you quickly realize that what happened out in the Gulf was a real technological leap. It fueled the life we know now. Before World War II, people knew there was probably oil beneath the Gulf seafloor. But it was too expensive, too risky, not worth it. Then came the war. The U.S. ramped up oil production by 30%, supplying 85% of the Allies' fuel. Wells on land started drying up, and suddenly, drilling offshore didn't seem so crazy. After experiments on lakes, then off piers, then floating a little ways offshore, the first rig out of sight of land came off the coast of Louisiana in 1947. Then came the big leap in 1954, Mr. Charlie, the first truly mobile offshore rig. Before mobile rigs, wildcatters had to spend a bunch of money and time building a whole structure over one spot where they thought there might be oil. If they were wrong, they probably went bust. With a mobile rig like Mr. Charlie, you could drill a hole, and if there's no oil there, just move on if it's dry. Billions and billions of dollars flowed down to Texas and Louisiana following that innovation. People back then knew what was happening on the Gulf. It was a big deal, heroic even. In 1953, Hollywood made Thunder Bay, starring Jimmy Stewart, the same guy from It's a Wonderful Life. He plays a wild catter, part engineer, part entrepreneur, part cowboy. And the whole movie's about one thing, refusing to let man or nature stop him from pulling oil out of the Gulf. Without oil, this country of ours would stop and it'd start to die. Then came Shell's Blue Water One in 1962, a floating drilling rig that pushed exploration much further offshore. And way out there, dozens and dozens of miles offshore, the industry discovered highly pressurized and porous turbidite reservoirs. These reservoirs were formed by ancient rivers depositing sand deep into the ocean. They produced 10 to 30 times more oil per day than the shallower wells closer to shore. Suddenly, Shell was bidding on all sorts of deep water leases held by the U.S. government. Government refused to participate in any single bidder auction, so Shell decided to release all of its technology to its rivals, open source it, you might say. That led to a whole new burst of technology, like diving suits that NASA would borrow tech from to make spacesuits for Apollo astronauts, and algorithms to help keep structures steady amid waves, hurricanes, and shifting sediments. By the way, Shell's 1996 Deepwater Mars program cost more than NASA's Mars Pathfinder program. The difference between the early structures built offshore and the new ones built hundreds of miles out to sea is drastic in their size above water, the depths they go below water, and their productivity. Early rigs rested on the seabed and only went 20 feet deep. Then came jack-up rigs, mobile barges with legs that lift above water. Those were used up to 100 feet. Next, there were fixed platforms, permanent steel or concrete structures, used up to 1,700 feet. Then, compliant towers. That's for up to 5,000 feet. And then, tension leg platforms used up to 7,000 feet. And finally, deep or ultra-deep rigs anchored or dynamically positioned. And they go out to up to 12,000 feet or even deeper. 
The more that I think about what happened out in the Gulf in post-war America, the more it reminds me of something like the highway system or the advent of the internet. The cheap, stable supply of energy that flowed from all of that work, all that innovation, all that risk, it led to a post-war economic expansion that changed and set a standard of living in the United States that we have all gotten very used to. It was amazing. You know what else is amazing? Artificial intelligence and the way it's changing how we work. Which is why I'm so excited to tell you about a new AI tool from Framer, a company that makes building websites easy. I'm not just a host of this episode. I'm also the CEO of Dynamo, the company behind Business Explains the World. We named it Dynamo because it describes you, people building careers, communities, companies, and lives. Dynamos always have big ideas, and big ideas need websites. Enter Framer. I used Framer's AI tool, Wireframer, to start building a website for this show in no time. So it prompts us to create a landing page for, let's say, Business Explains the World, Dynamo's flagship YouTube show. Look at it go. It spun up an entire framework for our new website. That really eliminates writer's block. No blank page problems here. There's an AI chat on the side here where we can ask it to do even more. Let's select Show Featured Episodes. That looks great. You can see I spun this up in a few minutes. Now I can use Framer's tools to tweak everything and bring this website to life. Use our custom link to get 25% off of Framer and sign up for free. Thank you to Framer for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the golf. So the build out in the golf, it's the kind of thing that makes you marvel at what humans are capable of. But why are humans from the very same industry leaving so much of their infrastructure out there abandoned and rotting? The story of the industry in the Gulf is one of going deeper. Shallow water wells hold less oil than deeper ones, meaning they dry up quicker, meaning they become less profitable faster. Tech advancements make deep water wells much more profitable. So moving on from a rig, I got it. It makes sense. But why just abandon them? Maybe I was overreacting just because these things are so ugly. Do they actually hurt the environment? Are they actually bad for the local economy? To find out, I flew down to Louisiana and yeah, no, they are very dangerous. It took me about two minutes on a boat with some locals to figure that one out. This is Justin. His dad was a shrimper and his first job after high school was working on a boat cleaning up busted rigs. You have 10,000 pounds of pressure coming out of a tube about four inches, yeah. and it's just blowing hundreds of feet in the air. It's basically hell on earth when a blowout happens. I've been in a few of them. Things get hairy. Yeah. What Justin made clear to me is that the problem with abandoned oil rigs isn't what you see above water, it's what's below. Gulf water is murky with sediment, but if you could dive below one of these rigs and see clearly, you'd see a massive steel structure anchored firmly into the seabed. Extending down from the platform are multiple steel pipes, each one a separate well, plunging 200 or 300 feet below the surface to the seabed. From there, these pipes keep going deeper, much deeper, 10,000 feet deeper, through layers of rock, sand, and salt to tap into reservoirs of oil and gas trapped deep underground. That's seven Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other, stretching downward toward the Earth's core. Each well is carefully lined with steel casing and reinforced with cement to handle extreme pressures and keep oil flowing safely upward. From there, pipelines run along the seafloor, carrying oil for miles back toward the coastline, where it's pumped on shore to refineries for processing. A vast underwater network of steel and concrete, an invisible web sprawling silently beneath the surface for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And over time, materials fatigue, metal weakens, welds crack, seals erode, insulation breaks down. Aging infrastructure means failure isn't a question of if, but when. Every well is a portal to the underworld, right? And you have to care for that hell mouth because it's turning earth into hell on earth. That's Scott. His family was in the oil business in the Gulf for generations. Now, he's part of an organization trying to get the industry to clean up after itself. What happens 10,000 feet down sometimes has no relation, no communication with the surface. And the longer we let wells idle, 20 years, 30 years, they can come back as zombies and random blowouts, and that causes injury and death, oil spills, the things we don't want. And that's what we see growing. 
So that's why we're putting out the call to finish the job. When an oil well is abandoned but not properly sealed, it's like leaving a shaken soda can in the freezer. Pressure builds underground. And if that pressure finds a weak spot, whether it's corrosion, cracks, or old equipment, it can erupt in what's called a blowout. Blowouts are rare, but when they happen, they're catastrophic. Deepwater Horizon in 2010 spilled over 200 million gallons of oil, making it the largest marine spill in history. And while that was from an active well, unplugged abandoned wells can blow too, especially in unstable areas like the Gulf, where mudslides triggered by hurricanes can snap aging pipes like twigs. And here's the real problem. There are thousands of unplugged wells in the Gulf of Mexico, many of them sitting in deep water, corroding and forgotten. Each one is a potential hazard. Mother Nature just ravages them and they're out in the open. So when the next hurricane comes, God forbid, we didn't have a hurricane in 2009 when the deep water horizon happened, but we're just one hurricane or one boating accident away from a serious catastrophe with these wells that are just littered on the, the coastal area of Louisiana. In 2004, Hurricane Ivan triggered an underwater mudslide that toppled an oil platform owned by Taylor Energy off the coast of Louisiana. It became one of the longest running oil leaks in US history. Eventually, the government stepped in, hiring contractors to contain the mess after Taylor Energy essentially dissolved. The total cost of the cleanup has run into the hundreds of millions. One thing you sometimes hear from people who want you to not worry so much about oil spills in the Gulf is something like, hey, did you know that oil naturally seeps into the Gulf of Mexico from reservoirs? And yeah, that's true. Estimates are very rough, but we've seen millions more gallons of oil coming from aging infrastructure. So the next question is, why don't we have laws to prevent this from happening? The funny thing is, we do. And they sometimes kind of sort of work, but obviously not always. Here is what's supposed to happen. When an oil company wants to drill offshore, the federal government steps in to regulate. First, oil companies have to pay upfront bonds, basically deposits, that guarantee they'll pay for cleanup when they're done drilling. These bonds typically run between $100,000 to $300,000 per well, and from half a million up to about $3 million for a platform. When production dries up and the company leaves, these bonds are used to hire contractors to take apart rigs and plug wells safely. And there's a vibrant industry built around this. It generates billions of dollars and employs thousands of people across the Gulf region. Between 2016 and 2021 alone, about 1,800 shallow water wells and 580 platforms were properly decommissioned. But there's a catch. Those amounts I mentioned, they sound big, but they often don't come close to covering the true costs. Decommissioning a single well can easily run anywhere from one to over $10 million, far more than the bond covers. The total cleanup backlog in the Gulf is somewhere between $40 billion and $70 billion. And the government holds only about $3.5 billion in bonds. Hold on, let's do some math. 3.5 billion, 70, but that's a lot less. On top of that, these cleanup projects are supposed to happen within one year of a rig being taken offline. But more than 75% of Gulf infrastructure is past that deadline. So that's the first problem with what's supposed to happen. It doesn't set aside nearly enough money for anyone in the industry to clean up after themselves. The second problem is that often the companies that abandon oil rigs and wells in the Gulf aren't the ones that built them. So we think this one's built by Chevron. Why do we think that? Chevron was very active in this yeah. area. And when you look at the age of these assets, Chevron owns a lot of them, yeah. or they were Texaco. A big oil company built it. And when they build it, they set aside some cash there and say they're going to in order to eventually take these things down. Right. But then they don't really put enough aside, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Think about renovating your bathroom or any construction project, the costs increase. And the longer we wait, the longer we stall in planning this kind of thing, yeah. the more expensive it gets. And even when they set aside money like this one, it gets sold to somebody else and it gets sold to somebody else sometimes even after that. 
Right. right. Well, and, this and the liability doesn't always travel with the new owner, especially an asset like this. This was sold by Fieldwood to okay. Gulf of Mexico Oil Show as part of a bankruptcy. Oh. So the company that was most recently operating this before GOM Show okay. did go bankrupt. Oil companies often use bankruptcy to avoid cleaning up after themselves. Here's how it works. A big oil company makes a ton of money off of a rig over its lifetime. But once the wells beneath it start slowing down and getting less profitable, the big oil company sells the rig to a mid-tier company, one that's happy to make smaller profit margins. But then the wells get even less profitable, and that second smaller company sells the rig off again. The company that buys the rig at this stage doesn't have a lot of capital reserves, money saved up. They buy the rig to squeeze the last bit of profit out of it. Then, as the wells finally dry up, these poorly capitalized companies go bust. All the profits they earned are in someone else's hands now, and they go bankrupt. And then it's up to a bankruptcy judge to figure out who has to pay for the cleanup. Often, the answer is nobody. One of the rigs we saw out there was owned by Fieldwood Energy. Another one of the rigs used to be. It turns out Fieldwood Energy is one of the Gulf's biggest offshore operators, yet, they filed bankruptcy twice, in 2018 and again in 2020. In 2020, they had an idea. Keep all the oil rigs and wells in need of expensive decommissioning in the company going bankrupt and move all the profitable new ones into a new company. In 2021, the bankruptcy court said, sure. So that right there is why we have so many abandoned oil rigs and worse, oil wells waiting to go burst in the Gulf. It's often fully legal. By the end of my day out on the Gulf looking at abandoned oil rigs and getting an education from Scott and Justin, I learned that not only are abandoned oil wells out there dangerous, I learned that regulators and the courts aren't really equipped or interested in making sure the industry always cleans up after its mess. So what can be done? So ultimately, I think bankruptcy laws and the way these companies have maneuvered around it only partially explains what's going on out here. And what that reminds me of is the tragedy of the commons. Imagine a village and it's got a commons at the middle, like a big green field, and shepherds take their sheep there. And no one has oversight over the commons. Well, eventually, the sheep eat all the grass, and that screws the shepherds, but it also screws the rest of us who depend on that commons. So, that's what I see when I look at these oil rigs. I see sheep overgrazing, basically, in a big common field. Unfortunately, there's no giant industry that's about to come out and save the Gulf from rotting infrastructure that could turn into blowouts at any minute. There are people turning rigs into things. There's a hotel, and some people think you could put windmills on rigs or make them hydropower stations. And over in the North Sea, they turned one into an art installation. And the oil industry would love to tell you about how you can turn rigs into reefs. But you and I know now that as cool as some of those ideas are, they solve the wrong problem. They solve the oil rig problem, not what's underwater, the oil well problem. Probably the most promising business that might solve some problems in the Gulf is called Gold H2, a well-funded startup out of Texas. They say they can drop microbes down used up oil wells and get clean energy, hydrogen fuel, out of them. They're not doing it in the water yet because it's too hard. Well, guess what was too hard 50, 60, 70 years ago? Building oil rigs and drilling out in the water. But in 1947, we built an oil rig out of sight of land anyway. In 1954, we got Mr. Charlie. Then Shell built Blue Water One. And then they basically developed spacesuits for astronauts. If the history of this place and the people, people like Justin and Scott, have taught me anything, it's that when there is an opportunity, humans can do incredible things to seize it. And it's the kind of thing that I thought about as a kid when I was sitting in the water, looking out of the horizon, thinking about what was off in the distance, what was over there beyond the horizon, the future, adventure, opportunity. That's what we have here, and that's what we need. <laughs>